By 9 a.m., Forrest had arrived with the rest of his troops and supplies and set up his command tent by the remains of the old Confederate ramparts. Riding to the edge of the bluff in front of the garrison to look over the operation, the wizard of the saddle had the first of two horses shot from beneath him for the day. The horse reared from the pain and fell on top of the major general. His adjutant, Captain Charles Anderson, cautioned him as he mounted the next horse. I'm just as apt to be hit one way as another, and I can see better where I am. With approximately 1,600 Confederate forces, the Federal troops did not have a chance. The Federals were fighting back with a vengeance. It took all they had to stand their ground. Union Major Booth fell, struck in the chest by a sharpshooter's bullet. Bradford assumed command and ordered Booth's body to be removed discreetly from the line of sight. While Forrest ordered more sharpshooters to fire down on the garrison, Bradford had a small company to sneak out and try to burn down the last four rows of cabins nearest to the breastwork. Bradford hoped that would create a smoke screen from the sharpshooter's fire. They were intercepted by McCullough, who used these cabins to begin small arms fire into the fort. The cabins also provided shelter from the bombardment from the gunboat, New Era, which was docked parallel to the Confederate forces. The New Era fired in vain at the thick woods to knock out the sharpshooters. At this time, the Confederate lines made a menacing semicircle around the garrison, with McCullough at one end and Bell at the other to tighten the circle even more. Forrest went against Bell's recommendation and ordered Bell's subordinate, Colonel C.R. Bartow, to take the northeast area by Cole Creek. Once Bartow reached the site, Forrest moved Bell's troops to the edge of the bluff into position to storm the garrison's front. He sent word to McCullough to seize the trench under the Federal ramparts at the earliest possible moment. With his chess pieces now in place, Forrest used the light of the mid-afternoon sun to compose a message similar to the one he wrote to Colonel Hicks at Paducah. He addressed it to Major Booth, commanding the United States forces at Fort Pillow. Major, the conduct of the officers and men garrison in Fort Pillow has been such as to entitle them to being treated as prisoners of war. I demand the unconditional surrender of this garrison my men have received a fresh supply of ammunition and from their present position can easily assault and capture the fort. Should my demand be refused, I cannot be responsible for the fate of your command. Respectfully, Nathan Bedford Forrest, April 12, 1864. Be mindful that in 1862, the Confederate Congress uh, passed a resolution that any black man taken in arms would be returned to a state of slavery. Any black man taken in a Union uniform would be summarily put to death. Any white officer in charge of black troops would be deemed as starting servile insurrection and would be likewise put to death. When asked by some of his officers about the black soldiers, Forrest made it clear to all to treat them the same as the white soldiers. He sent Captain W.A. Goodman with a message under a flag of truce to the garrisons. All guns fell silent, including the new eras. Just then, Forrest noticed three more smokestacks coming up the river. The ships were loaded with Federal soldiers and guns requested by Bradford that morning. Forrest quickly instructed Captain Anderson to prevent the landing of these steamers with three companies of men at the riverbank. The three ships sailed closer to the left bank of the Mississippi as Captain Anderson's men followed them. Forrest told Bartow to follow suit for the north bank. Feeling that the tide had turned, Bradford sent back a reply requesting an hour to confer with the garrison officers and those aboard the new era. 
Throwing an additional ace on the poker table, he signed the note with Booth's name. Bradford's winning hand fell short when word of Booth's death reached Forrest just an hour before. Convinced that the garrison was stalling for time, Forrest commanded Captain Anderson to fire a couple of rounds at the passing ships to ensure their non-involvement. He then told Federals that he just wanted the fort, not that damn gunboat, and give them only 20 minutes this time for their resolution. Bradford used the time to contact the new era with his plan. Before the Confederates could take them, the garrison personnel would use the bank directly under the fort to board the gunboat while it laid down cover fire. With nowhere to dock and from the puzzling all clear signal from the new era, the three ships steamed on up the river, ending the garrison's only hope for a victory against Nathan Bedford Forrest. As both Confederate and Federal troops watched the steamer's trailing smoke vanishing into the horizon, a Union officer, under orders from Bradford, handed Forrest the Federal's final reply on a scrap of paper. General, I will not surrender. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, Major Booth. Precisely at that moment, upon reading the note, the Major General rode up to General Chalmers and the rest of the officers. We must take them. I will watch with interest the conduct of the troops, and I desire to see who will first scale the fort. A gray cloud floats over the fort. It is April the 12th, 1864. And it is like the earth and the sky know that something horrible is going to happen here today. Bradford had disillusions about the ability to hold the fort. With Booth's help, he could have held the fort longer than the 15 minutes that he ultimately managed. It was three o'clock and a general charge was ordered the Federals using the breastworks for defense from the sharpshooters were the first ones to see the massive tidal waves of brown-clad men jumping over every wall. Their ears rang from the deafening roar of the rebel yell. The columns of Confederates steady poured into the garrison as retreating Federal soldiers fired back. Had they been stopped at the bottom of the wall, it would have been like shooting fish in a barrel. They knew their losses would have been high. So when they go over the top, their adrenaline is high, the enemy's running. They're carrying carbines and pistols. Did they all empty their guns? I'm sure they all did. I'm sure a lot of people got killed who, on, under other circumstances, might have been able to throw up their hands and surrender. But it's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of animosity. Uh, these are your former friends, neighbors, associates who have changed sides. These are people of a different race. In addition to being the enemy, there are a lot of other emotions running here. 